today at our special senses. Now first, think about what a special sense is. There are general senses which are scattered over a large part of the body. Think about receptors for touch or hot or cold or something such as that right there. But then there's our special senses. Those are the senses which are isolated to just one small region of the body. So you think about your sense of smell, taste, vision, hearing, and balance. Those are all isolated to one small region. That's what makes them a special sense. Now, the first one we'll look at here is our sense of olfaction, which is our sense of smell. Now, there are thousands of different odors that your average person can recognize, but there's actually seven primary odors that often are looked at. The dendrites of these little olfactory neurons have enlarged ends called olfactory vesicles, which hang out right up here in the very top of your nasal cavity. If you want to smell anything, you got to draw air in. There'll be chemicals in that air, whatever that may be it is that we can smell. And of course, all things we can't. But you draw that air in, and whatever those chemicals are, will stick to this damp mucous environment right up here at the very top of the nasal cavity. Here's where you have the dendrites of these olfactory neurons. And whatever that chemical is, it can open up ion channels on these different neurons. That'll create a depolarization, which generates an action potential. And of course, those electric signals can be sent back to the brain. But looking back down here at this olfactory epithelium, this is replaced fairly common, about every two months. And remember, that's very, very rare. These are neurons we're looking at that give us this sensation of smell, just like we do with our other senses. Now, as a general rule, when neurons are lost, that's it. They're not coming back. But since these olfactory neurons are very exposed to the outside environment, they are destroyed from time to time, but that's all right. Every few months, they're replaced. So that's really rare when it comes to neurons. But looking at some of these neuron pathways for our sense of smell, it <clears throat> starts with these little olfactory neurons, which are bipolar neurons. Remember, bipolar neuron is just simply one that has one dendrite and one axon. You've seen that back in a previous chapter. They're found up in this epithelial layer at the very top of your nasal cavity called the olfactory epithelial layer. And they pass through the cribiform plate. That cribiform plate is a very thin bone right there at the very top of the nasal cavity. Sometimes if somebody hits their face hard on something like maybe a steering wheel in an accident, they can fracture that cribiform plate. That'll give access for bacteria from your nasal cavity up into the central nervous system. Very bad thing. But just above that cribiform plate is where you find those olfactory bulbs. And you can see them on this model in this previous picture. Those are going to synapse what's called tufted or mitral cells. That'll go back through the olfactory tract. It's a bundle of axons going back towards the brain. That'll synapse with association neurons on further back into the brain itself. Information will go through this olfactory cortex into the frontal lobes. That's where these association neurons are going to take their action potentials to. And one thing that's very unusual about the sense of smell is that this sense does not pass through the thalamus. You think back to the thalamus in the brain, it is a major sensory relay center. And all senses do pass through the thalamus except the sense of smell. So that's very odd with that one right there. And there's three different regions in that frontal lobe that affect our perception of smells. It's interacting with the limbic system at the same time. Well, there's a lateral olfactory area that's involved with our conscious perception of the smell, so that actually gives us the ability to sense it. There's the medial olfactory area, which gives us visceral and emotional reactions to odors. Maybe you smell something that's rotten or really bad, you might get a bit of a sick feeling in your stomach. That's what's meant by visceral response. And then there's an intermediate area, which can modify this incoming information. Anosmia is a term that means a lack of a sense of smell for whatever reason. Sometimes that's simple as you're getting a cold. You get a big buildup of mucus in your nasal cavity. Those chemicals may not get to these sensory neurons. You may not be able to smell anything. And a smell we're all familiar with is material called methylmercaptan. That's what they put in natural gas so we can detect it. Otherwise, we wouldn't know when it was in the environment around us. So let's move on to our sense of taste. <clears throat> Another special sense right here. These are associated with taste buds located primarily on the surface of the tongue on these structures called papillae. So the surface of our tongue is covered with these papillae and there's four different types of papillae. The first one here, the valate, are the largest but also the least numerous. There might be about eight to 12 of these on your tongue 
and they're found towards the rear of it, about two-thirds back. They'll be in sort of a U-shape, so sort of towards the back there. Then there's the fungiform type of papillae. These have a bit of a mushroom shape. You look at these with a light microscope. These are scattered all over the surface of the tongue, and if you get up close to a mirror and look at your tongue and see small red dots, that's the fungiform. There's also another called foliate. Notice how that word sounds a little like foliage because these are leaf shaped. Think about how an oak leaf looks, and that is how these look. You actually can, could see them. These right here are very sensitive and they decrease with, uh, in number as we get older. Just another thing we'll lose with aging. But lastly, with the papillae, we have the filiform. Now, they tell you these are filament shaped. Good name form, they're shaped about like a straw or a pipe. And even though these are the most numerous of all the papillae, these don't have any taste buds associated with them. Now, looking back at these taste buds, these are the sensory receptors for a sense of taste, whatever that may be. And we'll look at some major senses of taste here in just a second. But all these little taste buds and cells have microvilli on their surface called gustatory hairs that extend out into these taste pores. And just like the neurons associated with our sense of smell, these are very exposed to the outside environment. They get damaged, so they get lost. And these will be replaced about every 10 days. And again, that's very odd with neurons. Generally, you can't replace them, but with sense of smell and taste, those you can. And if you think about how much uh, these could be damaged, all the hot things we put in our oral cavity and hard things we chew on, makes sense they could get damaged and destroyed, so we need to be able to replace these. <clears throat> but when it comes to taste, there's five primary tastes. First one we'll mention here is sour. Now most of the receptors for the sour taste are found laterally on the tongue to the outside edges. Then there's salty. These have a low sensitivity, just like sweet does, but that's probably because we put so many salty things into the oral cavity, they don't need to be sensitive. This sodium on enters these little sensory receptors, you'll get a depolarization and generate an action potential. Then there's bitter, <clears throat> and of all our taste, bitter is the strongest of them all. This one has the highest sensitivity, and the reason being plants, which have poisons in them called alkaloids, have a bitter taste. So we're very sensitive to bitter things because they could be poisonous. And of course, we don't want to be eating those. So it's a good thing we have that sensitivity to bitter. Then there's sweet. Of course, this is all about the sugars and the carbs. We have a low sensitivity to these. And then the last one is umami. That's a Japanese word that means savory and basically refers to things like meats that we eat. Remember, those proteins are assemblies of amino acids. So these receptors are sensitive to those amino acids. And many things affect our sense of taste. Think about texture. You may not like something which is maybe very slimy if you were to eat it or some people like their ham very thick, some thin. Just depends on the texture of it as to how they like it. Maybe more one way, less another. Temperature. A lot of people like their coffee hot and a lot of other drinks cold. So temperature seems to affect taste in some way. And taste, just like smell, has a very rapid adaptation. In other words, it lessens quickly. At first it can be very strong, then it tends to go away. And our taste and smell are tied together. Often by smelling something, you often know whether you might like the taste of it or not. So those two are definitely tied in. And the different tastes have different thresholds. In other words, we have different sensitivities. But again, remember, bitter is the most sensitive of them all.